dignitaries, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to our open forum ASEAN. My name is, yeah, that's great. My name is Philip. I am here with the World Economic Forum. I'm responsible for all our regional summits, but to be very honest, this regional summit, this open forum is very, very special. First, it's really the first open forum at our ASEAN summit, so you are here for the first time. And even we have had some other open forums in Davos or in other regions, this is by far the biggest open forum ever. More than 2,700 young Cambodians are here with us today. That's amazing. The second reason why it's so special for me and for my colleagues is, look, I will not bother with, with personal stuff, but I am German, a German citizen. Even I look a little bit Asian. And the reason is pretty easy. So, I was born, we have not even been planned, so 44 years ago, during the Vietnam War, in Vietnam, not far away from here, around 100 kilometers down the Mekong River. Most likely, my parents have been killed during the Vietnam War, and I ended up in a Catholic orphanage in the Mekong Delta. Thanks God, as a little baby with nine months, I was adopted from my parents to Germany. I grew up in Germany. I got there the chance of my life in a country like Germany, well embedded in a multilateral body, means the European Union. My parents have been very keen on education, so I have had to go to school, unfortunately. I went to school, I went to university, I became a physician, a doctor, I have a PhD in heart surgery. Then I joined politics, left the medical stuff, became a state minister, later a federal health minister in Germany, and then Minister of Economy and Technology and Vice-Chancellor means the deputy of Angela Merkel in the last legislature. So look, a little baby out of the Mekong Delta could come to Germany, become a Vice-Chancellor. And guess what? This was only possible, again, because after the Second World War, Germany was embedded into the European Union, and our grandfathers and fathers and mothers and grandmothers they all created this multilateral body, a very peaceful and very stable environment. And this is the best basis for prosperity. And guess what? Now it's on you. Your average age here in the room is not even 20, right? Maybe two or somewhere like this. And now it's in your hands. Certainly, it's your own way you have to create the ASEAN community. It's also a multilateral body, already 50 years old. And you can create a multilateral body. I could benefit from values like democracy, human rights, transparency. There was no corruption, rule of law, and again, prosperity. And it's now on you to decide what should be the face of the ASEAN community today? It's your responsibility to create a similar peaceful and stable environment I could benefit from for you, for your generation, and for the following generation. And it's not on us from the guys here from Europe like me to give you any advice. Because one thing is pretty clear. The future of ASEAN has to be written in ASEAN. And that's written by you. And you have so perfect, excellent examples here on stage. They will share now the ASEAN dream they lived with you. You can ask questions and then you can start your engagement for your ASEAN dream. Again, a warm welcome. Thank you very much for being here. On that note, I'd like to hand over to Jamal. 
Thank you so much, Philip. Uh, I think everyone can agree your, your story is one of uh, truly uh, inspiring stories um, of, of our generation. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. I'm really pleased to be here. My name is Jamil Andalini. I'm the Asia editor for the Financial Times newspaper. Uh, I'll be your moderator today. I'll be moderating the questions uh, from the audience and uh, uh, asking questions of our, of our wonderful panel here today. So the topic of our, of our session today is called, it's the ASEAN Dream. Uh, so more than half the population, as many of you know, in ASEAN is under the age of 30, which is astonishing uh, when you think about it. Also, ASEAN is the region that has the fastest growing internet population in the world. Every single day in this region, 124,000 new internet users are created uh, every single day. That's, that's really an amazing statistic. Uh, today we're going to hear about the ASEAN dream of our very distinguished panel. Uh, on my left here, your right, is uh, Weiwei New. And Weiwei has an amazing, almost as amazing story, I think, as Philip, or about as amazing story as Philip. Uh, Weiwei spent seven years as a political prisoner in Burma, Myanmar. Uh, she was imprisoned because of the political activities of her father, and she was just telling us before um, how she spent uh, these seven years in a cell with her mother and her sister, but was not able to see her father for that entire time. She was uh, imprisoned at the age of 18, 19, uh, a truly incredible story. And the most incredible thing I think about Weiwei, we all agree, is just how positive and uh, how uh, you know, forward-looking she is. And that's uh, been a real inspiration. Uh, next to Weiwei is uh, probably most of you in the room are already very familiar. This is Kao Kim Hun, who is the minister attached to the prime minister in charge of foreign affairs and also in charge of ASEAN, so very relevant to what we're going to be discussing today. Thank you so much for being here, minister, and for helping to organize everything. Uh, next to him is Tony Fernandez. Most of you will also be very familiar with him, uh, the CEO of Air Asia since 2001 when he founded the airline, uh, known globally as a rock star businessman uh, and uh, very frequently seen on, on television and in the Financial Times and many other media outlets. Uh, next to him, last but not least, is uh, William Tanuwajaya, who is the co-founder and CEO of Tokopedia, which is one of the fastest growing uh, internet companies in the region, uh, it was the very first in 2014, which he explained to me is like a millennia ago in uh, tech terms, but in 2014, Tokopedia was the very first uh, tech startup in Indonesia that raised 100 million US dollars. So a very successful young man who uh, will tell us uh, a lot more about his ASEAN dream, I believe, uh, coming up very soon. So I'd like to start she told me not to start with her, but I'm going to start with Weiwei. I'm sorry. I want you to, to get us started off. Define for us, what is your ASEAN dream? How would you describe your ASEAN dream? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Your wonderful uh, uh, introduction, too. I'm really pleased to be here in front of particularly, like, thousand about two thousand young people here and I'm always feel empowered whenever I see young people so when you say well, what is your dream uh, of ASEAN I would say of course I wanted to say at the last because it would become I think it would be the most critical uh, 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 a dream because we understand that ASEAN come together as a purpose of, you know, development and uh, uh, like, um, uh, you know, to become a community, developed community in the, in the country, uh, in the region. However, I think uh, development can be only sustained when there is, uh, when people 
are secure, when there is uh, say, uh, the, the, the security, private security, public are secure, and when there is like uh, inclusiveness of the community in the region, uh, in the countries, respective countries, accessibility of the people uh, in, in the region, like, uh, you know, everyone has access to those uh, aim, those dream, and those purposes, and those opportunities of the of the uh, uh, of the development, or 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 for the dream. And more importantly, I think it is very important to address uh, the fundamental issues and problems that we are facing in the region and in respective countries, particularly when it it's come to the long-standing conflict and the questions of human rights uh, abuses. So my dream is to have a uh, to become an inclusive society where we can all people all in the region can enjoy um, freedom and, and, and security and with respect of their uh, dignity and human rights. So this is my dream. Right now we have we have this um, uh, a lot of like uh, ob uh, obstacle and we I think something is lacking in our our uh, community of ASEAN, which is critical voice. So in the future, in our generations, in the next generations, I hope ASEAN can be more open to have to have more critical voice on the fundamental issues. That is my dream. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's, uh, I think that's a really critical point, that we can't discuss anything uh, if people do not feel secure and they don't have basic uh, human rights, basic uh, access to, to uh, normal, uh, the rights that you're describing. And the right not to be thrown in prison at the age of 19, I think, is a pretty fundamental, uh, if you haven't committed uh, any crime except um, your father's political uh, activities. So... Uh, moving on to uh, Minister, could you tell us, you, actually you said something very important I think in the, in the room when we were chatting before. You said something in some ways quite similar that without peace and stability uh, it's very hard to talk about development. Um, but, but please, I'll let you speak for yourself. What is your ASEAN dream? Thank you very much, Jamel, distinguished panelists. I see ladies and gentlemen, particularly our youth here. I'm indeed honored to be invited to be on this panel and to share my view on the ASEAN dream. ASEAN, 50 years on, and as we reflect on the future of our region, what's come to my mind, I always think about the five Ps. That's how I think we define the future of ASEAN dream. The first P is called Peace. We must ensure that ASEAN will have perpetual peace. And we, can take, we cannot take peace for granted in this region and this part of the world. So perpetual peace is going to be one of the dreams of ASEAN. Second, I would say it has to be prosperity. Prosperity for all. I know it's, it's, a, it's a daunting task for the governments, for the different institutions in ASEAN member states, but also in ASEAN collectively. But prosperity is not an impossible task for all, as long as we work together to share the benefits of development for all. I think we can do this. My next P, of course, I'm always looking at poverty. In our region, we still have pockets of poverty. We cannot deny this reality. But poverty elimination is the goal of every government in this region. And that's why we work in hand, hand in hand to build a community, a sharing and caring community that will work to reduce poverty in the pockets in this part of the world. And let's go on to my fourth P, and that's progress. Progress has to be made not only by governments alone, but by the different parts of society in our region. Progress in all sectors, from education to agriculture to trade 
and among other things. And progress, of course, also has to work in hand in hand with our partners beyond the region. So progress is really uh, always that we have to review regularly how are we making our progress in all the sectors of the society. And finally, come to my last point, and that's, I think it's very important. At the end of the day, we must focus on the people. People center, people audit ASEAN. ASEAN is about people, about people to people connectivity. That's why I think this open forum for ASEAN is one way of defining how we reach out to the people. And that's what ASEAN governments have been doing now, is to reach out to the people, particularly the youth, who represent the future of this region. And I think all of this is that we cannot take for granted what we have been achieved, what have already succeeded up to now. And we have to thank the forefathers of ASEAN, and of course, the current leaders who have strived very hard to maintain peace, stability, and security. And that's why we've seen in the case of Cambodia, we've seen the Cambodian miracle, the ASEAN miracle. We have peace, stability, and security, so that now we can focus a lot more on development, on sustainable development, on how to bring down poverty, how to maintain peace, focus on education, that every person should have the right to education, for example, and decent jobs and skills. So I end with that. The future rests in our youth here. They have the best opportunity now because their parents may not have been able to enjoy the same opportunity that they have. Today, our youth have the best opportunity to capitalize on. They have the future ahead of them. And of course, once again, we cannot rest on what we have. We cannot take peace for granted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. I think uh, your five Ps uh, are a good way to uh, see what's happening in the region and the priorities for the, for the region. Tony, what, uh, what, what is your ASEAN dream? Well, it's, um, it's going to be very hard to follow these two. Uh, but uh, firstly, I want to, uh, it's fantastic to be here in Cambodia. What an amazing country. And you should be all very proud of everything you've done in this country. It's, um, it's truly amazing for me to come back here after so many years. So congratulations to all the Cambodians for all you've done. Uh, you should be very, very proud, having gone around all of Asia, um, seeing how friendly people here, seeing how you develop, seeing how you're so positive. It is quite an incredible place for me to come to. So thank you for welcoming me here. Uh, so warmly in your amazing country. Thank you very much. Uh, my dream is very simple. I hope all of you only fly on AirAsia forever <laughs> from now. <laughs> uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, no. Um, look, when I, when I started the airline 15 years ago uh, with two planes, uh, not a lot of money, but a dream. And, and I love the title about ASEAN Dreams because I'm a dreamer. I believe that without dreams, there can be no reality. Without pushing yourself and saying you can do it, uh, nothing will ever happen. And over the last 16 years, we've grown from two planes uh, to 200 planes. In the first year, we carried 200,000 passengers, and this year, we will carry uh, 63 million passengers. And um, it's been an incredible ride because what we saw when we first started AirAsia was this amazing 10 countries called ASEAN. Everyone was focused on China and India, but we said if we could build an airline that connects ASEAN and makes it a smaller place so that the people of ASEAN could get to know each other better, then what an incredible business model we could create. And so that's what we've done, and of, our, of the 60% of destinations that we have started, uh, sorry, of the 100%, 60% of destinations that have never been done, and of those, the majority are within ASEAN, making ASEAN a smaller place. So my dream is um, for the people of ASEAN, if I take YY's point, um, to be more inclusive, to get to know each other better. I think what Minister said is ASEAN has been successful in putting peace together, we have a very peaceful region over the last 50 years. It's now moving that and taking that peace and building more economic prosperity and using the 700 million people that live in ASEAN to benefit from each other. 
to bring down the barriers, to open up the non-tariff barriers and create a huge economic powerhouse that can rival India and China. And at the same time, I believe economic growth leads eventually to better human rights, more openness, um, and a better quality of life. Uh, I, I feel very strongly about human rights. I sit on the Council of Amnesty. And so I think economic prosperity can't go without human rights as well. So my dream is that really, if, if we were to be honest, what does ASEAN mean to the population of, of the 700 million people? I'm not sure it means a lot. And I hope over the next 10, 15 years, as ASEAN becomes more interlinked, that ASEAN becomes to impact more people in this room and in Malaysia and Indonesia, etc., and that all of our prosperity grows and of our quality of life grows as well. And in 15 years' time or 10 years' time, all of us will feel special about ASEAN, that it's more than just a word, and that we've all benefited from ASEAN. And of course, don't forget, please fly in AirAsia. Thank you very much. <laughs>
we just become the market. We are consume all the internet product from especially US market. But starting perhaps 10 years ago, we start to see the homegrown entrepreneur start to create their own local internet services. And just in the past four to five years, we see the rise of a new industry. In Southeast Asia alone, now we perhaps have at least seven multi-billion dollar company from the tech sector itself. One from Vietnam, three from Indonesia, and three from Southeast Asia. And I truly believe this is just a new beginning. So technology will keep changing. Internet will keep changing, right? So the next will come artificial intelligence and so on. So we are not only seeing that the one that can create value out of it is the one that just being the part of that industry. But that industry alone will create a lot of application. For example, our business in Indonesia have more than 1.5 million individuals and small business owners to start and grow their business. So it creates another sector of industry. Right? So this is a, a truly the fourth revolution industry. Right? So the, on the third industrial revolution, for example, people don't really to be involved in creating a personal computer to be able to be a part of the game, right? So I wish to see more of this uh, uh, new industry uh, comes up. And this is definitely uh, the level playing field, right? So internet give access to everyone in the region, connect everyone in the region. Minister, maybe I can turn to you. Since you're on the National Economic Council here in Cambodia, so how focused are you on connectivity and uh, increasing internet access for people in Cambodia? Well, for Cambodia, as the newcomer, uh, started in 1993, particularly after 1998, we did not really invest a lot in the, what we call the, for example, the telephone and landlines. But everything started on uh, mobile technology, like smartphone, like uh, mobile phones. So that uh, investors can come in, uh, people can benefit quickly, we can leapfrog. So one thing about technology is to leapfrog as much as possible without wasting time and resources. Uh, so that's one thing that I think the Cambodian government has been doing. Second, uh, that this is an open society. Cambodia Day is an open society, uh, meaning that uh, there are very little barriers here. And therefore, for example, when it comes to business sector, every sector is completely liberalized, meaning that if you cannot compete, the government not subsidize. So uh, that's why a uh, foreign investor can, own, can set up a company 1% owned by, uh, by foreign investors, for example. So uh, also technology here is that we have to make it accessible to more people. We have to make it cheaper for technology, particularly for internet. And that's why recently one of the companies, uh, they began the investment in the, uh, what we call the underwater cable network. So the idea is to bring the cost down as much as possible and to uh, increase speed. Uh, at the same time, is to uh, for the people to be able to use. Uh, right now, we have 3G, 4G in Cambodia some, for some time already. And not just 3G only in name, but 3 or 4G, but really an actual uh, delivery. So for, for us, I think what's important is that but the technology with the internet, young people have access to more information around the clock. They can uh, look up everything freely. The problem, the challenge here is that not everything is reliable, right, on the internet. Fake this news. Is, yes. So this is the problem. We have to, how do we verify what is reliable uh, information out there? So I think that's something that we have to uh, to do more homework there. But for, for us in Cambodia is that uh, we need to leapfrog where we can take advantage of uh, being the latecomer, but also we have to hook up our economy with regional and global economy through speedy integration. And that's why uh, everything we do right now, for example, in Cambodia we have e-government. Every time we have a cabinet meeting, we have video conferencing to all the provinces in Cambodia and to all the different offices. So, uh, of course, on the one hand, you talk about 
confidentiality and all that, but I think the government is quite open, very transparent. A lot of things that, we, that the government decides automatically is uh, put on the Facebook, the Prime Minister, for example, or uh, already being released immediately. So uh, this is how transparent we are uh, moving ahead with that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take Tony's lead, and I'm going to say, if you want reliable information, you should buy a Financial Times subscription online. <laughs> Your very fast internet connection in Cambodia, you'll be able to read it uh, perfectly. So, um, Tony, maybe you could tell us a bit about how your industry, which is quite a traditional industry these days, uh, how are you being disrupted by uh, technology, by, by the speed of, of uh, connectivity in, in the world at the moment? I mean, I think this, the internet is the most exciting thing for ASEAN because um, it's giving us a chance to leapfrog uh, more traditional industries and compete aggressively. So AirAsia started you know, we were the first airline to use the internet, and that's how we were able to compete against uh, the bigger airlines, Singapore Airlines, MAS, etc. And now 85% of our business is on the internet. So I'm a big, big believer in it. I also have beginning to see many ASEAN entrepreneurs, um, such as William, etc., coming from uh, the internet and create, seeing a, a much larger marketplace. Uh, you see Grab Taxi. You see many of these companies going cross their borders much, much quicker, uh, partly because I think governments haven't regulated, so it's enabled uh, business, entrepreneurs to be much, much quicker in building these internet businesses. And so I think um, the whole digital revolution is very exciting for ASEAN. It should be very exciting for the 2,000 younger generation here because there are lots of budding entrepreneurs. I think ASEAN must be driven by entrepreneurs. It's got to be. One thing that we're a little bit at a disadvantage by vis-a-vis uh, -vis China and India is borders. And that's what I hope these borders come down. So William, if he wants to sell goods across ASEAN, has to go through many customs windows. There's no single, single window as opposed to China where you can ship your goods anywhere or Europe, etc. So I think that's something ASEAN has to work harder on so there will be more Williams and more entrepreneurs coming through that can take the size of the market. Going forward, I think um, you know, we see technology as an enabler. We see that we, you know, we're Wi-Fiing our planes. We think data is a phenomenal thing that we can use uh, to make our passengers travel better, but also we can sell more with it. And I'm very excited by artificial intelligence. It is incredible what is happening in that field, uh, the pace of that's going. Again, I think that's a huge opportunity for Cambodians, a huge opportunity for ASEAN to get into that technology while it's still early. Um, I see huge advancements in artificial intelligence. It's going to disrupt all of us. It doesn't mean that jobs are going to be lost. We shouldn't be fearful of uh, technology taking out jobs. We should move up the curve in terms of productivity using uh, technology. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. What I see in AI is quite astounding. But if you don't change, and I think that's the message that I'm giving is that um, if you don't change, you'll be lost. The pace is really quickly. Change management is so critical now in Southeast Asia and in companies in Southeast Asia that if you miss the boat, you could be obsolete. You know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, Nokia was so, so powerful. We all had a, a Nokia phone. We were talking about it earlier on and Motorola. They've gone now. That's an opportunity for all of us, but it's also a danger if we don't adapt quick enough. And sometimes I fear regulations slow us down. Thank you. I think we'll come back to that in a minute. But I wanted to ask uh, Weiwei. So you're the founder and the director of the Women Peace Network. Uh, and you were talking a little bit to me before about uh, how you're trying to use social media to empower people in, in your home country in particular. Do you want to tell us a little bit about, about that? Yeah, I think, um, I truly believe the technology uh, is not only things that connect each other, um, you know, it, it, it gives us a lot of opportunity for our, um, uh, like, a career for, you know, to pursue our dream. 
And as I, 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 I real, uh, as I really appreciate the title of this uh, panel, you know, we can pursue our dream by, by using technology, uh, but also we can inspire others by using technology and social medias. As, as um, um, uh, you know, as, as we discussed in, the, the, in, in ASEAN, uh, increasing the number of uh, Facebook user and social media user by young populations, it's a unique. And I, I believe we have to be using it effectively. And I would always like to encourage, and I also do the same, uh, to inspire other young generations and encourage them to use social media and technology effectively. It is because we can see as, um, you know, oh, we can see that a lot of the uh, negative uh, side of the usage of social media by having fake news and by, 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 by using opportunity, the technology as an opportunity by interest group to promote propaganda, to promote hatred, to promote racism, uh, you know, those things are happening around the region. And so uh, uh, what I do basically is, you know, encourage other young people, you know, to use uh, this uh, uh, Facebook and social media uh, to uh, effectively to actually take responsibility for their own, uh, how to say, community or the people or the country or the region. We can use it. It is our responsibility, uh, you know, to use effectively, to use positively, to shape our future. Uh, if we don't take responsibility as young people for our future, the interest groups of the, uh, in, in our community, they will take advantages by using this. So basically I have, so while in, in Myanmar, while we have this violence against Muslims or, you know, like this communals and, and also this, this, you know, discriminatory violence happen, and there were a rise of uh, nationalism, uh, you know, basically uh, like uh, uh, lead by some, um, uh, you know, uh, even Buddhist monk who we respect a lot. Um, so there are a big uh, critical situations there were, and it's, it's continuing, uh, you know, the rise of this, you know, nationalism, extreme nationalism, something like that. And, and what we do is come up as a positive messages by using social media, uh, you know, showing evidences of friendship among diverse community, like friendship between diverse ethnic groups and religious groups, uh, and honoring those friendships in social media by saying that here are the, the example. Uh, we prove as an example without even saying it you know, that by giving stories and examples of relationship that people have. And that, then we prove that here we have the good stories, we have a good relationship, we have been living together and we are, uh, we, we've been living peacefully and we can live together continuously. We shouldn't be afraid of diversity, we shouldn't be afraid of others who we don't like. You know, this is how we like to uh, we like to take responsibility for our community by using social media uh, positively. You know, by being with responsiveness. You know, by by having full commitment to to our community. So that is why I think you know we have to be using this uh, technology as an opportunity to shape our future and to uh, you know uh, to to pursue our dream as well as to inspire others. For example, like for me, uh, I do inspire actually many young people in my community and in the country by just using technology, uh, social media, what I, you know, by saying what I want to say, by showing what I am doing as an example. And like in the past, I, we know that like leaders of the countries, uh, business leader, political leaders, they have to use a lot of like, like you know, how to say, the, the formal channels, like ordinary channels, like they have to come up in front of the people, give an inspirational speech, and write letters and things like that. Nowadays, it is very easy because of the, this opportunity of, tech, uh, you know, the, 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 the development in, in technology. So we can inspire others. We can, and as young people, we don't need to, uh, you know, wait to get opportunity. We can use the technology 
instantly to inspire others to uh, take responsibility in, uh, you know, uh, for, for our community, uh, for our countries, for our region, by using social media effectively, as well as to have, you know, better connectivity to be more connected. For example, if something happened in my country, by using social media, you can immediately can learn it, and then you can immediately respond and show solidarity. That's how we can be together by using technology in the future in our region. Thank you. Tony, you mentioned uh, the idea of, um, you were talking about regulations uh, and borders, and um, maybe we could just uh, move on to the idea of ASEAN as a, as a actual unit and what it, what it actually means. Um, how important is, for each of you, is greater integration amongst, uh, amongst these uh, very different countries. I think if you looked at any group of countries uh, and you compared Myanmar with Singapore, you couldn't get almost uh, more different than, than those two when it comes to development level and, uh, and uh, access to electricity even. I mean, it's, a, it's quite a vast gap between these two, but they're nonetheless both members of, uh, of ASEAN. So maybe, um, starting with you, Minister, maybe you could talk about how you see ASEAN integration, whether you think it's a positive thing for greater integration and how that might happen? I think ASEAN integration is all about the good things for the people in this region and also for the partners ASEAN is working with. Integration in all forms and at different levels and across sectors. For example, we talk about economic integration. There's a lot of things that uh, the ASEAN governments have been doing through the work of the ASEAN economic community, for example. Uh, also, integration through even the education sector, for example. Uh, how do we recognize uh, what we call mutual recognition, for example, the degrees from one country to another. So we have to integrate, we have to harmonize. Uh, integration also, uh, how ASEAN get integrated into the global community. Because, for example, now we work with uh, other partners through OSEF, the Regional Comprehensive Economic uh, Partnership, for example. That's another level of integration. But I think at the end of the day is that we have uh, many, many levels of integrations in different sectors. I'll take one example, one ASEAN now work to have a single window. This is, of course, uh, it's going to require a lot of works, but the commitment is there now that if, say, goods move from Cambodia to another ASEAN member state, we have one inspection already. When they arrive to another destination, we should, have, we should not have another inspection, for example, because uh, to save time, to save costs, uh, all of this. Uh, so integration is that uh, if we work together well, save time and save costs. Um, also, uh, when we talk about integration here is that we're talking about, I think, even in the uh, transport sector, because the ability to connect uh, each other. Uh, and I give an example. Before, when we travel within the ASEAN zone, we, take, we have to, for example, in the case of Cambodia, if we want to go to Manila, we have to stay overnight in KL, Singapore, or Bangkok. But today, we don't have to stay overnight. This is because of increasing connectivity and integration uh, through infrastructure uh, integration, but also integration through the harmonization of legal frameworks, for example, that's another thing. Uh, also, people to people, because now, in the ASEAN zone, we don't need visa, right? Uh, uh, more than 600 million people can move freely in the ASEAN zone without visa. And that's being done because of the integration in this region. And this will continue to speed up. We're going to gain more momentum. Uh, we're going to see more benefits, uh, not only for the current generation, but also for the young generation, the future generation, that integration will benefit all. It will benefit everybody. 
Uh, also, for example, integration through labor mobility. We can move around now. Of course, at the moment we talk about skilled labor, uh, this is what we have in the ASEAN Charter. But mobility uh, is there in, in the ASEAN zone. So, uh, again, I think there's a lot of government works that we have to uh, address, meaning that in the future, government will continue to uh, work in the different sectors, uh, particularly through the P three pillars, the political security pillar, the ASEAN economic uh, community pillar, and of course also the social cultural community pillar. So all pillars, we have to work together. Also the same thing, uh, ASEAN, we have a lot of diversity also. And uh, these diversities should be a strength of ASEAN. Because the end of the day is that we should be integrate and appreciate the differences that we have. And that's another thing that I think we, we have to recognize is reality. So uh, finally, I want to say on the integration is that the most important thing is that how ASEAN agreement once it decided by the ASEAN ministers or the ASEAN heads of states and government, these agreements would become automatically the laws in each country through the ratification process. And that, in a way, is part of the broader integration of the legal framework. And that's why with the ASEAN Charter that was uh, adopted was signed in 2007 and then went into effect in 2008, these have made ASEAN the legal body. And that's why what we decide now collectively is part of the whole ten, uh, the ten ASEAN member states. So I think this is really how we need to do is that for the younger generation, I think this is very important, is that how do they see the future of ASEAN integration? Not only uh, one member state integrating to ASEAN or uh, at the sub-regional level, two or three more countries get together and they work together. But how ASEAN uh, uh, is able to work with, say, China, India, Japan, Korea, the United States, among others in the global community, how we integrate, how ASEAN it will take advantage uh, to uh, being together a 10 member state with more than 600 million people, uh, how we're going to be able to, to attract FDI, how we're going to be able to uh, ensure that this region is safe for uh, tourists from other uh, regions to come and visit ASEAN, uh, how we also uh, send up a youngster now, they go over, uh, outside the region to study and come back, but also now there are other countries sending their students to ASEAN to study about ASEAN also. So this is all the broader integration that we see is happening, particularly with the technology, with internet, this is with greater speed and with abundant opportunity. And that's why I want to say, uh, uh, one of course is that now is that increasingly our young people, when they're exposed to each other quite often, because in ASEAN now, we talk about so much about cooperation, but also we talk so much about competition also. It's not just cooperation, but it's all competition. So that's why the young people now, we have to ensure that they have more ability to compete with the region but to compete globally, so that because how we integrate into the global community is how we're able to compete. Uh, second, of course, is that I think how we raise the profile of the ambition of the young people. Uh, they, they, today, I think, uh, with 50 years of uh, achievements, the young now have more confidence, and they want to take on the integration to a higher level. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. You've given us quite a positive view, but maybe, Tony, you could tell us what uh, ASEAN still needs to achieve when it comes, from your perspective in particular, what ASEAN needs to do better. Well, I mean... There's As a, a lot, regional grouping. Yeah, there's a lot that can be done better, but just, just, to, just to spend two minutes on the diversity part, I think that diversity is our strength. And I think, you know, within four hours of ASEAN, there is such diversity, there is such riches and culture... And that is what we've exploited. Within our own company, we have a Thai CFO, our head of communications in Indonesia. We've just hired a very senior Cambodian to be in our marketing department. And that is our, our real strength. We've been able to grow because there's so much talent in ASEAN. But people have been very um, structured in how they've looked at hiring people. Well, we've busted all rules 
And that's how we've grown the way we've grown. I mean, we have lots of religious and ethnic issues in Malaysia, but we've said we don't care what race, creed, color you are. If you want to be the best, then you can come and join our company. And I think the more companies look at the talent pool within ASEAN, then they have a huge, incredible resource which is not being used. And, of course, there are lots of issues. I mean, in starting AirAsia, you know, when we went to Thailand the first time, everyone wanted to do things differently because they said we're Thais, etc. And I'll, I'll tell you a little funny story. Um, the, the Thai pilots refused to go in the bus with the cabin crew. They said it was beneath them. They needed their own bus. In Malaysia, it's the other way around. The pilots refused to go in the bus unless the cabin crew were there. Um, so you can see the diverse, the diverse functions. So how did we solve it? We sent uh, 10 Malaysian pilots up to Thailand to show them what the benefits of going in the bus together. And net-net, we had five Thai-Malaysian marriages. So we were integrating ASEAN from a very early stage. Um, so it can be done. And just to all the future entrepreneurs there, of course, there are loads of obstacles. You know, there are loads of obstacles, but there's always a, a positive light. You know, during SARS, no one wanted to fly. They all thought they would die if they flew. And I told my, my staff, look, I know the people of ASEAN. If you put a fare low enough, they will risk their lives. Okay, 800 ringgit to Phnom Penh, I'm not flying. 80 ringgit, who cares? I'm flying. So, so, so you we're contributed a, to the spread of SARS as well. Yeah, you're correct. So we're a tough lot. We're a tough lot. But as I said, the thing that I would really hope ASEAN will improve dramatically is the ASEAN Secretariat. I think it needs more budget. I think it needs uh, more expertise there. As a, as a company in ASEAN that operates, we would love to go to one body to say, here's our suggestions, whether it's harmonization, whether it's human rights, etc. And I think, um, you know, ASEAN right now works on consensus and goes through 10 countries and it takes a long time. And I'd hope that more power was given to the Secretariat so things move uh, quicker. The potential is huge. The potential is really huge. And uh, I think everything the Minister said, I echo. Um, I just hope it can be a little bit faster. And I think if ASEAN put people first and not worried so much about protection or nationalism, everyone will benefit from a freer and open uh, environment. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask uh, all of the panelists or whoever would like to, to answer uh, and maybe keep your answer relatively short because I want to also give everyone in the audience an opportunity to ask questions of our excellent panel. But um, how important is democracy? Uh, when we look at um, the US in particular, but many countries in the West, uh, the idea of Western democracy maybe at the moment is a bit of a tarnished brand. <laughs> um, uh, but, but how crucial is democracy and the political freedom to choose your leaders uh, when it comes to development and integration? I mean, how, how important is that to, to you guys? Whoever wants to answer, really. Who wants to go first? I mean, Indonesia, maybe William. Uh, uh, you might not think about it, maybe, but... Uh, oh, yeah, a democratic country. Hmm? Um, no? Uh, Tony, would you...? I think democracy is fundamental. I think what, what was said earlier, um, being open to criticism. It's just like my company. You know, right now, there, there are many airlines that are similar to us, named after animals. We have lions, we have tigers, we have all kinds of airlines like us. But that makes us better. Competition makes us better. And monopolies are bad. And I think democracy allows more competition, allows more criticism, allows a check and balance. And I think it's no, no secret that the freer a country is, the more creative thinking there is, the more openness there is. For, for whatever faults America has, and it has many, it is a fairly free society, and yet they're always reinventing themselves and coming up with Google, coming up with Facebook. The creativity is there. So I think democracy is fundamental. It's a good check and balance. It provides competition. And I think us in ASEAN should be open to criticism going forward. And uh, just like us, we've got to be open to criticism. You know, if we drag a passenger off the plane, we'll be hammered. Uh, but we don't, by the way. Don't worry. We'll look after you very well on AirAsia.
Wei Wei, would you like to? Yes, I think this is my favorite question. Um, however, I'd like to answer. For me, democracy, it's about participation. And democracy, it's about the will, you know, the consent of the people, you know, where people can enjoy, took part in all process, particularly in, in, in government, in governance system, you know, how they want to be governed or how they are going to govern. They have to be able to make their own decisions by all people, inclusive inclusion, participations, and freedom. It's a key in democracy. If we have these things in our systems, in individual countries, and as a region, if we have more, you know, I like the a statement from um, um, minister that we celebrate diversity and we respect and, and maintain diversity among the region. Likewise, I think it's essential to have this diversity and reach regionally. We have to promote diversity and respecting others, you know, uh, like recognition, recognizing others which can only be done by inclusions and by participations and by respecting people, you know, uh, like desires of freedom. So, which is again democracy. So, by having democracy internally, can enrich our ASEAN uh, aim and goal more effectively. We can really achieve like sustainable development. That is why it is vice versa to have democracy, freedom, political freedom. Uh, you know, uh, like freedom of expressions and participations and, and respecting diversities and, 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 and you know, uh, promoting diversity, recognizing the, all the groups inside the groups, inside the countries, it's essential to have, uh, you know, it's essential. And, uh, and again, it is essential to promote democracy in each country. And, and that's, that, that, I believe, you know, can lead our ASEAN shape uh, to a lighter future. But now, as I mentioned earlier, there are some certain problems of, you know, like talking uh, among the ASEAN leadership, you know, uh, you know like uh, talking about and addressing the critical issues, uh, you know, fundamental problems and conflict in the, con in, in, in the region and plus individual countries. So the, the, there are some problems that has to be solved. For example, like, so, uh, you know, as a human rights activist, I, we have talked, uh, you know, several, many, many diplomats and government and people like that. And last uh, human rights sessions in Geneva, I was in Geneva, and I was asking one of the diplomats from uh, Indonesia, you know, I was saying that you have to support, you know, like international independent investigations in the country, in my country, because, you know, domestic mechanism does not work to pro protect people in the country, particularly in western part of the country against the Rohingya and many other ethnic groups. And Indonesian diplomats tell me that if we support this, or if we, sup if we support the, 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 the draft resolutions that allow special reporter on human rights in Myanmar to investigate the human rights violations in the, in, in the country. If we agree with that, there will be uh, another uh, proposal like that to our country to have, you know, to have this kind of similar, uh, uh, you know, uh, proposal will, will be faced by my country. So, you know, if you truly want to have sustainable development and one you know, uh, help each other in the region to develop ASEAN uh, uh, substantively and meaningfully, I think you have to be very honest. Minister, you know, I, I'm sorry to say that I think leadership in, in, uh, in our ASEAN re region has to be very honest and supportive of each other's, uh, you know, uh, internally as well. That's how we can uh, uh, enrich regionally. I, I, I think this is, uh, uh, this is really, really critical. And thank you for the questions. And democracy is fundamental, as Tony mentioned. Thank you. Well, in the ASEAN Charter, the word democracy and other words like transparency 
rules of law, good governance, they are enshrined. We're looking at the Asian Charter, which is one of the shortest documents ever uh, drafted uh, compared to EU. This is a, a very small document. But the leaders of this region have this goal already in mind. They want to ensure that ASEAN uh, lives by this principle of democracy. I think to, to me, how I look at democracy, of course, is very important. Democracy is about the will of people, that they will regularly decide the future of the country through recollections. But it's also about openness, about freedom and with responsibility. Also about the rule of law that everyone is under the law. So it's also about open society. ASEAN is it's important to have ASEAN being open. And that's what we see, that things are moving along this front. So if we have this process being open, and that's why uh, we're looking at this uh, particular charter, uh, they have become the living document for all the ASEAN governments. So in the case of Cambodia, we see clearly that this is open society. Uh, we have elections every five years. It's a fixed five-year term, uh, meaning we must have election, election every five years. And it's set on the last uh, Sunday of July every five years. It's set in the constitution of this country. We must have election. Um, and of course, access to information, because being open, meaning you have people are able to access information. Uh, also, uh, that there will be uh, a due process, and that's very, very important. Now, of course, no democracy is perfect in this world. As we've seen, uh, what's happening uh, around the world, uh, in the U.S., in other countries too, uh, at the end of the day, what matters is that uh, the people will have to vote for those uh, leaders that stand for election. And, uh, but I think democracy, we have to look at in the ways that uh, will have to be a step by step also. Because uh, development, the rise of people, education, among other things, cannot be uh, forgotten. You know, if uh, once people are well fed and the country is well developed, uh, all this will go together very well. So uh, I think it's imp uh, what's important is that we are living in an exciting time. Exciting time that uh, before, let me give you an example in ASEAN. ASEAN ministers and leaders would not be able to take up sensitive issues. This is to be put under the carpet. We don't discuss, period. But today, I think in, in the past uh, five, six years now, leaders would take up some of the most sensitive issues and discuss openly among themselves. They just talk about the situation in Myanmar, for example, before. They discuss bilateral issues, Cambodia, Thailand, for example, on the border issue. Uh, that would not happen before. Uh, before on the issue of human rights, you know, we don't discuss much. But now we have the ASEAN and the problem, uh, the ICHA, for example, uh, the Commission of Human Rights. So what I'm trying to say is that ASEAN has come a long way uh, in addressing some of the sensitive issues. And uh, they are able to take up matters that are very sensitive, but yet be able to arrive at an agreement that we have to move on. So I think uh, in this regard, I think is that the progress is there, and I'm sure ASEAN governments will continue to build on 
these achievements on human rights, on democracy, on, on freedom of expression, all of this, uh, these are looking back at the uncharted area, and I believe that uh, uh, ASEAN will continue to make uh, more uh, successes and achievements on this front. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. So, uh, we're running out of time. I want to give the audience a chance, uh, some of the 2,000 young people in the room, a chance to, to ask a question. And uh, there's someone very quick, put his hand up, his or her hand up, I can, waving at the back, at the very, very back. Maybe I'll give that person, since they were so precocious, got their hand up first, yeah, the, with the red shirt. Uh, is there a microphone we can give to that person to ask a question? Hello. Run, 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 no. Hello, thank uh, you very much. Um, okay. Thank you very much to all of our speakers here. This has been very interesting. My name is Naishka, I'm with CNBC. Um, Minister, I have a question for you in particular. Um, you talk about democracies and uh, the importance of access to information, which we all know is very vital for Southeast Asia. Could you talk to us a bit more about Cambodia in particular and um, its treatment of government critics because we've seen quite a number of episodes over the past year that have raised speculation about the government's um, treatment of critics as well as political activists. So I would love to hear more from you about that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I, the way I look at things is that uh, you do not, uh, we have to look at things on a case by case. Um, Cambodia is an open society. We have a lot of newspapers that criticize the government all the time. Uh, look at uh, whether Phnom Penh Post or Cambodia Daily or other newspaper, for example. Even the Khmer language newspaper, which is fine. Uh, they have been criticizing all, all along uh, for many years now, uh, decades. But there is a law that there's a limit to how much uh, you can criticize without evidence, for example, because uh, you cannot go around defame individuals, for example. Uh, it's a free society, but yet we have law. Okay? Uh, and you don't want to play with law. No one can play with the law, because if you play with the law, you get into problems, for example. Uh, so I think what is important is that, uh, you know, If you're looking at all what's happening, I would say these are different isolated cases. Uh, not really uh, putting together as this is a government uh, crackdown on human rights and critics, critics of government. Because then why the government has to provide all this access to information? Information on the cabinet meetings, uh, on, the, the, on the decision of government. Uh, and what we always say in Cambodia, there's, there's nothing secret. Once it's decided, it's being published uh, immediately. So I would say that, uh, again, the rule of law is important. We have to emphasize the rule of law because without rule of law, democracy is chaos. It's anarchy. All right? Because... You cannot, have, you cannot have organized anarchy. That's a, that is a, a contradiction. So I think what's important is that everyone should have a fair hearing, a fair trial. All right? Once they uh, get into this process, uh, uh, it's important that they have a fair trial in the process. A media, of course, is an open media. Uh, they report as they wish. Uh, again, I think uh, if you look at ASEAN member states, uh, what we report in Cambodia, I think in some member states, was saying, you go to jail already, or you be basically sue our, uh, uh, go bankrupt already. You see? But in case of Cambodia, uh, most of the time, the government would not take on you. So it's let you continue on as it is. But when it's affect the national interest, like for example, a border issue, in a particular case. Okay? A border issue, when you have a member of a state institution, like the Senate, 
or a member of the parliament, you go and remove a border post. That's illegal. That would be prosecuted. Okay? Or you publish information on the internet. You delete, you add your own words or such agreement between two countries. You cannot do that. Okay? And that's what happened is that uh, certain individuals, uh, they have uh, run to the law because they went on the internet, they were able to access a particular document, and they doctored that document. And then, uh, because this affects the security between two countries, for example, and also the, uh, the interests of the country. And that's why I think within the rule of law, within the law, the government will have to take uh, responsibility to sue individuals between the court of law, before the court of law, okay? Which is normal in the country, right? So I, I would say that uh, it's not so much a government crackdown against critics, but the government selectively choose cases that they believe that affect the national interest, the security of the country, and that's uh, what the government had done, is to take individual, go through the uh, due process of law. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to select some people, but I don't know where the microphones are. Are there ah. the person in the red shirt? Good. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name's Sarat. Um, I'm part of, of a startup uh, yeah, yeah, um, in Cambodia. I most likely want to know more about how we can leverage and improve the digital economy of, of a Cambodian um, yeah, economy. Um, I have two questions. One to Williams. Um, I know you guys very clearly, so I'm like a fan of Tokopedia, and uh, so you're part of Unicorn of Asia, this is so cool. Um, this is like, um, um, yeah, Tokopedia growing rapidly fast, and, and the valuation is growing rapid, rapidly fast. But uh, in Cambodia, we, we want to know um, how could we learn from a startup ecosystem in, uh, um, 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 in Indonesia, and what should we improve, and what should be the next stage, and, and, and how can we motivate the young innovators in this room to thinking about, um, or to motivate about building the, the solutions for the social impacts like yours. The other point, uh, the other questions to, um, uh, to Tansri um, um, Yitoni. Um, I see a lot of um, disruptive innovations coming every day. I see the AI is coming, and then we see like a Hyperloop or e Huang in, uh, in China. They are, go they are going to launch the, the drone taxi in Dubai soon. So do you think that, that, that those people would, would be affected to, uh, to your company or not in the future? And how do you think about the, the, the innovative um, um, uh, innovation um, in Southeast Asia would change in the next 10 or 20 years? Yeah, yeah thank you so much. Thank you very much. Maybe we can keep the answers short so that we can give more people uh, chances to, to ask questions. So, William, why don't you tell us, I think uh, the point of the question was how, uh, can, w how do you create an ecosystem for tech startups and, and what is your advice to Cambodia? So. Yeah, so it's need to start from somewhere and I think that it starts from the mindset. Right? So it's not possible for Tokopedia 10 years ago to when I want to start my business, it took me two years to convince people uh, to give me the first financing to start the company. At that time, people would ask me about the role model, right? There's no success case of Indonesia, of Indonesia or Southeast Asia entrepreneur that can build a technology company and become wealthy. All the successful businessmen is, uh, start from mining or like natural resources and so on, right? And there's uh, always, a competition is so big, you need to compete with all the global players. Internet is borderless. So even though internet brings opportunity, but we are still living in a very skeptical uh, environment, right? So it's a very challenging. And people bear that time are asking about your uh, education background, your family background, and so on and so on. But again, if you come from this mindset and see on the opportunity side, internet actually is the era of underdog. If you see all the global players that raised from the internet era, at the first day, they are all underdog. They are challenging the status quo against all the odds. 
but somehow they can find a mission or a, a sector that they really care of and build a product that, that can really bring a value. Google is not the first engine in the world. They are trying to challenge the status quo, hasta la vista, Yahoo, a bigger player. Facebook is not the first so social media in the world. There's a, they're also challenging the status quo. So don't let people tell you what you can do or what you can't do, but you need to pick one mission or one sector that you need re really care of and build the best product out of it and focus on that. And remember, this is the era of underdog. You, you can do what, it, what you want to do. Thank you, William. I think that's, that's great. I think you can relate to that, Tony. Uh, the, the era of the underdog. And uh, um, the second part of the question was for you, and I think it was, it was about how I mean, you I see things being disrupted. I think disruption is the greatest thing about business and, and the greatest thing for young entrepreneurs is the ability to disrupt. And you're incredibly uh, well informed. Uh, we were looking at the, that uh, Uber, Uber kind of taxi, the drones. Uh, I think the only, the only thing I can say is you've got to be adapt to change. Change comes very quickly. And you have to have a culture that has the ability to change quickly. If you don't have that ability to change, you get steamrolled by uh, the disruptors. So at AirAsia, I always say, we're only as good as tomorrow. I don't care what happened for the last 16 years. No one will remember that. They'll only remember the next uh, few days. So we have to have the ability to change. We have the ability to uh, put our hands up and say we made a mistake and we have to try and do something different. And that's the only way to survive in this very, very competitive world as there's going to be more and more disruptions. And I think ASEAN is a perfect opportunity to really radicalize and shake up things. And I see it so much in the digital space, how quickly things are changing. I mean, Uber and Grab Taxi is a phenomena that wasn't around two years ago. And now many people aren't even owning cars because of it. And so, you know, maybe one day you can Uber a plane and AirAsia becomes quite irrelevant. <laughs> um, and then I will join the University of Cambodia as a lecturer. Uh, <laughs> so who knows what's going to happen, but just be prepared to change. And if your culture doesn't allow you to change, which is getting harder and harder for me, because now we have 20,000 staff, uh, if you don't change quick enough, you'll be history and uh, people like William will take us over very, very fast. <laughs> oh, sure. I have a question in the front here, if someone can bring the microphone. Sorry to make you run around, but... It's pretty cool how there's so many questions. Someone down here, just giving everyone a chance. Right in the front, sorry, front row, past the red, the red line. Thank you. Rami Sharaf, Senior Vice President at the Royal Group. Thanks so much for the panel and thanks for the World Economic Forum. We talked about integration. We talked about connectivity of people. I want to combine both and I want to talk about integration, but to break down the people and to be the voice of these 2,700 young Cambodian seeds of the future leaders of this country. For them, ASEAN is a slogan. For them, ASEAN is a dream. And this is actually the name of the session. How can we sincerely get the young Cambodians who are striving to play a role and to be part of this youth integration? If it is by academia, if it is by technology, if it is by exchange, if it is by in, uh, internships, if it is by being contained in some startups, because these guys need the right platform. They need a solid platform that can convince them that ASEAN is a dream to be achieved and not ASEAN is a dream to be fantasized about. Thank you so much, and the question is for the panel. Anyone want to tackle that? Uh, OK. 
Okay. Tony, why don't you go ahead? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think one thing you missed out is sport. Um, you know, I, I hope one day there'll be an ASEAN Football League uh, where Cambodia United is playing Kuala Lumpur City versus Surabaya United, etc. I think you, you're right, as I said earlier on, is, is ASEAN just a slogan? But I think the platform is there, and AirAsia grabbed the platform. Number one, you've got to be strong in your own country. Let's be real. ASEAN, you can't just suddenly say, I want to be ASEAN. You've got to have a platform in your own country is your platform. But ASEAN gives you the ability to grow outside your country into a much larger market to compete with um, the giants that are going to come. And I don't think we should block the giants from coming in because I think we're as good as those giants that are coming in. So number one for a Cambodian entrepreneur, the, the equivalent of William who's starting, so let's say he's starting the equivalent of Tokopedia in, in Cambodia or an AirAsia in Cambodia. So the first start is be good in your own country. And then you have the ability to grow it outside to a 700 million market. And I think that is what this dream is about. It's not about just in your own country of a population of 20, 30, 40, 50 million, but the potential of reaching a 700 million market. And then, as the minister said, to take that success to go to China, India, uh, North Asia, and the rest of the world. I think that's what this ASEAN dream is about. And we hope the leaders of the 10 nations start lowering the barriers to be enable that to happen. You know, as a small point, Minister, I've been wondering why it's still called the Sea Games, why we don't call it the ASEAN Games. Um, <laughs> because, and people will say, people will say, well, Timor Lest is there, so that's why it isn't. But I'm sure Timor Lest wouldn't mind it being called the ASEAN Games. So I think that the answer, sir, is that it's not about just going to ASEAN straight away. It's about step one, building uh, a business or an a, a organization within your own country, but then using the ASEAN platform to build a, a multinational. And I think that's what we hope the ASEAN leaders will facilitate more and that there'll be very many more entrepreneurs like the guy in the back wearing a red shirt that looks like AirAsia, um, relentless, relentless. I love you. Promotion. Thank you very much. And you know what? You know what? Because you're wearing a red shirt, if you see me at the end of this, I'll give you a free ticket to wherever you want to go. Whoa. Okay? Excuse me. Yeah. Quickly. I think that's a very uh, way of uh, throwing the stone and inviting diamonds. Um, I think ASEAN is more than a slogan because look at Cambodia, we are just 15 million people. No one wants to invest in Cambodia of this uh, small size market. Uh, but if you're part of ASEAN market, more than 600 million people, now that's a real market, a real size one market. So that's what we, uh, we've been doing is that we had to take advantage of this. It's not a slogan. Uh, second, ASEAN member states have agreed already when their nationals I encounter uh, a particular, uh, when, they, when they are in a dangerous zone, say a zone of conflict, then the embassies that base, um, as in, uh, embassy as in member state based in that particular uh, geography, the country, will be able to provide real assistance to the ASEAN nationals. So that's another uh, real thing that we could do also. This is a uh, it's not slogan, these are real things now. We have an agreement signed by ASEAN member state that they will assist uh, ASEAN nationals in a uh, conflict situation where they have embassy, for example. That's another uh, example. But of course, uh, what's important now is that how do we uh, constructively uh, engage, motivate, and interest and inspire young ASEAN uh, generation members to take ASEAN to a higher level? I think this is a challenge that we have to do. Thank you. Uh, do we have uh, another question here on this side, near the front? I can only see an arm, but uh, come forward, the arm's sticking up. Why don't we? Yeah, thank you. Yes. 
Stand up and uh, tell us who you are, please, and then ask us a question. Good afternoon, panel and audience. My name is Sok Thuyen. I'm from Panya Sastra University of Cambodia. I have one question to all panelists. Well, uh, in regard to the ASEAN integration, do you think what is the pro and con of the ASEAN integration in relation to the nation? And in terms of uh, NGO perspective, government perspective, and also uh, the business perspective as well. And also, it, uh, it's uh, an opportunity as well, like uh, Myanmar, Cambodia, and Laos, that we consider as a, a less developed country. And what is uh, the really pro and con that we could uh, seek out from this kind of integration that could push that uh, country to reach up like the world like Malaysia and Singapore. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a good question. So uh, if we could keep answers brief, that would be good, I think, because we're almost out of time. But uh, the key point there was what are the pros and cons to greater integration, particularly for the less developed members of ASEAN? So uh, who would like to tackle that? Anyone? Minister, yeah. Well, I mentioned a lot already about pros. Uh, there's a lot of benefits from uh, integration that uh, we are part of a bigger uh, size market. We're able to travel freely in the ASEAN zone with our visa. Uh, these are uh, concrete benefits. Uh, also, your degrees being recognized eventually in our ASEAN member state. Uh, you're able to move around and work uh, freely in our, if you have skills, you have degrees uh, in our ASEAN member state. Uh, these are some of the concrete uh, benefits now uh, for individuals in ASEAN, for ASEAN nationals. Uh, of course, uh, for cons, of course, is that uh, certainly for ASEAN new members, uh, we, our level of economic development is still lower. Our GDP per capita, of course, still lower. But again, uh, nothing is impossible. Uh, Cambodia, people look at Cambodia today, they don't think that we had genocide. They did not, some would not say that Cambodia was uh, suffer from a long period of conflict and isolation, for example. People forgot all of the past already, uh, all the ashes and destruction what, uh, that we had gone through. Uh, but yet, of course, uh, meaning that we have to catch up a lot. We have a lot of work to do, we have to catch up, meaning that we had to speed up our integration, we had to speed up our human rights development. Uh, we have to also uh, make sure that we participate constructively in all ASEAN negotiations at all levels, whether among ASEAN member states or between ASEAN member states and one of the dialogue partners, for example, or ASEAN. Uh, the other thing that we can benefit, of course, is that there are a lot of support for ASEAN, a lot of support programs through the Human Resource Development Support Program, where the trade program, training program, there's a lot of things that we can do. So I think it's always a plus uh, to be in ASEAN. And uh, also right now is that we can benefit a lot from the regional, but also sub-regional cooperation. We can, in ASEAN, we have also, uh, there are different programs that we call sub-regional cooperation arrangement. And also through ASEAN, we, uh, because like Cambodia, we are a small country, we don't have a lot of resources to open up all the embassies around the world. So what we could do is that we can engage major powers and other countries at ASEAN meetings, where we can have bilateral meetings, bilateral engagement quickly, use ASEAN as the cornerstone of our foreign policy, for example, use ASEAN as a way to market uh, our products, and take advantage of this. So these are some things that we take advantage of. Thank you. Great. Wei Wei, you'd like to say something? Uh, yes. Yeah, we can see some reluctancy in terms of integration uh, due to the country's economy status. Uh, we can even see the, the, the clearly at uh, the visa process, uh, you know, like country like Singapore or Malaysia, it's not easy to get visa uh, from country like uh, Myanmar. While I, I can come freely without visa to Cambodia, so, you know, you can see the differences very clearly. 
But I think to be able to balance those, uh, those uh, inequality among, among the state, uh, it is very important to promote uh, peace and stability in individual countries. As Minister was highlighting uh, peace as, as one of his dream, and uh, probably ASEAN dream. And without peace and stability inside the country, we cannot up, uplift um, you know, the, the, the economy. So without, in, uh, you know, without uh, having economic growth, we can never be, like never achieve like this balance in, in economic status in the region. So it, that is why I'm like emphasizing that like ASEAN member states has to support each other's countries to really bring peace in internally. That, that's how we can bring uh, extra peace in, and development in internally as a region. That is, that is one thing. And the other thing, your questions about the gap between young uh, generations and older generation. And I think there is, um, you know, we are kind of uh, influenced by this, you know, Asian value, you know, things like that. I I young people or women are, you know, less taken seriously, critically. But I think the ASEAN should take uh, uh, youth, young people, women, you know, like marginalized community very seriously. And, and it should be all in their agenda, not just only as uh, uh, a gentleman mentioned, not, you know, uh, it should be all, all youth, not only this uh, 2,000 youth in this room, youth who are in the refugee camps in Malaysia, youth who are in, on the hand of traffickers, youth who are, you know, like exploited by this, you know, uh, uh, due to this, this in, uh, corporate uh, agencies or, you know, the, due to this, 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 uh, uh, you know, transborder crime, criminals uh, P, uh, act and, and, and because of this inequality uh, uh, among the economy status. All youth boys should be heard uh, in ASEAN and future and it, it, their role should be you know, taken seriously. We have ASEAN Youth Forum, and this is a good initiative, and we really appreciate how, as Minister mentions, the ASEAN has come along, and it has to be strengthened by listening people, its people, as they value, the government leadership value people. It has to be, like, listening more carefully to the people and giving spaces to the people to really meaningfully giving spaces to the people, in, uh, particularly young people. That's how we can, uh, you know, bring in young people to the leadership uh, level. That's how we can, like, kind of, uh, you know, break through this, this, this gap between young generations and older generations. Thank you. Last, you have something last? Uh, just, not an ad for Asia? No, no, no more just, ads a, for Asia. just a real quick one. Obviously, just to answer the young man's question, there are, we've all been talking about the pros. And of course, there are some negatives. There will be some losers. This isn't a, a zero-sum game. And I mean, but I think, the over, you know, obviously some industries, some uh, companies within a certain ASEAN country may lose out, etc. But I think the overall benefit of ASEAN has been shown in any economic uh, grouping. The European community, take aside the euro, take aside the, the immigration and all those kind of issues. As a trading bloc, it's been very, very successful. If you look at South America, uh, also very, very successful. Uh, and after, you know, Donald Trump wanted to change it. Two weeks later, he said no, because it has been successful. So there are lots and lots of benefits. And just one small point, you know, there were no female pilots in, in Southeast Asia. We were the first airline to have female pilots. The other day was history. Captain was female, co-pilot was female. Wow. All the cabin crew were female, and all the passengers were male. Um, <laughs> well, that last bit's not true. So we have taken diversity all the way, and I fully endorse that. So thank I, you very much. I like to have humor like you. All the all the all the conversations having a little bit of humor, <laughs> so inspiring. And I will fly. I will promise. I I fly. There Asia. we go. I've won one passenger over today. <laughs> two. First one was free. Uh, I'd just like to, that's unfortunately all we have time for. Thank you all for coming. I'd like really to thank the really great panel. Um,
this remarkable and inspirational young woman, the, the minister for being a good sport when we uh, got into some tougher, tougher topics. Tony, for your relentless uh, marketing and, uh, <laughs> and humor, of course. And William, thank you for your story, which is really uh, a great one as well. So thank you all very Maybe much. Can I have two words to it? Uh, sure. I, my last two words is that please love ASEAN. <laughs>